Chapter 2 Introduction Why Beelzebub Was in Our Solar System It was in the year 223 after the creation of the world by objective time calculation, or, as it would be said here on the Earth, in the year 1921 after the birth of Christ. Through the universe flew the ship Karnak of the Trans Space Communication. It was flying from the spaces as Suparasata, that is, from the spaces of the Milky Way, from the planet Caritas to the solar system Pand Etznok, the sun of which is also called the Pole Star. On the said trans space ship was Beelzebub with his kinsmen and near attendants. He was on his way to the planet Revozevredendra to a special conference in which he had consented to take part at the request of his friends of long standing. Only the remembrance of these old friendships had constrained him to accept this invitation, since he was no longer young and so lengthy a journey, and the vicissitudes inseparable from it were by no means an easy task for one of his years. Only a little before this journey, Beelzebub had returned home to the planet Caratus, where he had received his arising, and far from which, on account of circumstances independent of his own essence, he had passed many years of his existence in conditions not proper to his nature. This many-yeared existence, unsuited to him, together with the perceptions unusual for his nature, and the experiences not proper to his essence involved in it, had not failed to leave on his common presence a perceptible mark. Besides, time itself had by now inevitably aged him, and the said unusual conditions of existence had brought Beelzebub, just that Beelzebub who had had such an exceptionally strong, fiery and splendid youth, to an also exceptional old age. Long, long before, while Beelzebub was still existing at home on the planet Caratus, he had been taken, owing to his extraordinarily resourceful intelligence, into service on the Sun Absolute, where our Lord's Sovereign Endlessness has the fundamental place of his dwelling, and there Beelzebub, among others like himself, had become an attendant upon his endlessness. It was just then that, Owing to the as yet unformed reason due to his youth, and owing to his callow and therefore still impetuous mentation with unequally flowing associations, that is, owing to a mentation based, as is natural to beings who have not yet become definitely responsible on a limited understanding, Beelzebub once saw in the government of the world something which seemed to him illogical and having found support among his comrades, beings like himself not yet formed, interfered in what was none of his business. Thanks to the impetuosity and force of Beelzebub's nature, his intervention together with his comrades then soon captured all minds, and the effect was to bring the central kingdom of the Megalocosmos almost to the edge of revolution. Having learned of this, his endlessness, notwithstanding his all-lovingness and all-forgiveness, was constrained to banish Beelzebub with his comrades to one of the remote corners of the universe, namely to the solar system Oars, whose inhabitants call it simply the solar system, and to assign as the place of their existence one of the planets of that solar system, namely Mars, with the privilege of existing on other planets also, though only of the same solar system. Among these exiles, besides the said comrades of Beelzebub, were a number of those who merely sympathised with him, and also the intendants and subordinates, both of Beelzebub and of his comrades. All, with their households, arrived at this remote place, and there, in a short time, on the planet Mars, a whole colony was formed of three centred beings from various planets of the central part of our great universe. 
all this population, extraordinary for the said planet, accommodated itself little by little to its new dwelling place, and many of them even found one or another occupation for shortening the long years of their exile. They found occupations either on this same planet Mars or upon the neighbouring planets, namely on those planets that had been almost entirely neglected on account of their remoteness from the centre and the poverty of all their formations. As the years rolled by, many, either on their own initiative or in response to needs of general character, migrated gradually from the planet Mars to other planets, but Beelzebub himself, together with his near attendants, remained on the planet Mars, where he organised his existence more or less tolerably. One of his chief occupations was the arranging of an observatory on the planet Mars for the observation both of remote points of the universe and of the conditions of existence of beings on neighbouring planets. And this observatory of his, it may here be remarked, afterwards became well known and even famous everywhere in the universe. Although the solar system ores had been neglected owing to its remoteness from the centre and to many other reasons, nevertheless, our Lord Sovereign had sent from time to time his messengers to the planets of this system to regulate, more or less, the being existence of the free brain beings arising on them for the coordination of the process of their existence with the general world harmony. And thus, to a certain planet of this solar system, namely the planet Earth, there was once sent as such a messenger from our endlessness, a certain Ashiata Shemash, and as Beelzebub had then fulfilled a certain need in connection with his mission, the said messenger, when he returned once more to the Sun Absolute, earnestly besought his endlessness to pardon this once young and fiery but now aged Beelzebub. In view of this request of Ashiata Shemash, and also of the modest and cognizant existence of Beelzebub himself, our Maker Creator pardoned him and gave him permission to return to the place of his arising. And that is why Beelzebub, after a long absence, happened now to be again in the centre of the universe. His influence and authority had not only got declined during his exile, but, on the contrary, they had greatly increased, since all those around him were clearly aware that, thanks to this prolonged existence in the aforementioned unusual conditions, his knowledge and experience must inevitably have been broadened and deepened. And so, when events of great importance occurred on one of the planets of the solar system, Pandet's knock, Beelzebub's old friends had decided to intrude upon him and to invite him to the conference concerning these events. And it was as the outcome of this that Beelzebub was now making the long journey on the ship Karnak from the planet Karatus to the planet Revzuvartenda. On this big spaceship Karnak, the passengers included the kinsmen and attendants of Beelzebub and also many beings who served on the ship itself. During the period to which this tale of ours refers, all the passengers were occupied either with their duties or simply with the actualization of what is called active being mentation. Among all the passengers aboard the ship, one very handsome boy was conspicuous. He was always near Beelzebub himself. This was Hussein, the son of Beelzebub's favourite son, Tuluth. After his return home from exile, Beelzebub had seen this grandson of his, Hussein, for the first time, and appreciating his good heart, and also owing to what is called family attraction, he took an instant liking to him. And as the time happened to coincide with the time when the reason of little Hussein needed to be developed, Beelzebub, having a great deal of free time there, himself undertook the education of his grandson and from that time on took Hussein everywhere about with him. That is why Hussein also was accompanying Beelzebub on this long journey 
and was among the number around him. And Hussein, on his side, so loved his grandfather that he would not stir a step without him, and he eagerly absorbed everything his grandfather either said or taught. At the time of this narrative, Beelzebub with Hussein and his devoted old servant, Ahun, who always accompanied him everywhere, was seated on the highest kaznik, that is, on the upper deck of the ship Karnak, under the Kal no Kranonis, somewhat resembling what we should call a large glass bell, and were talking there among themselves while observing the boundless space. Beelzebub was talking about the solar system where he had passed long years, and Beelzebub was just then describing the peculiarities of the nature of the planet called Venus. During the conversation, it was reported to Beelzebub that the captain of their ship wished to speak with him, and to this request Beelzebub acceded. Chapter 3 The Cause of the Delay in the Falling of the Ship Karnak The captain soon afterward entered, and having performed before Beelzebub all the ceremonies appropriate to Beelzebub's rank, said, Your right reverence, allow me to ask your authoritative opinion upon an inevitability that lies in the line of our course, and which will hinder our smooth falling by the shortest route. The point is that if we follow our intended course, then our ship, after two kilprenos, will pass through the solar system, Vuyonik. But just through where our ship must pass, they must also pass, about a Kilprino before, the great comet belonging to that solar system and named Sargor, or, as it is sometimes called, the Madcap. So if we keep to our proposed course, we must inevitably traverse the space through which this comet will have to pass. Your right reverence, of course, knows that this madcap comet always leaves in its track a great deal of Zilnotrago, which on entering the planetary body of a being disorganises most of its function until all the Zilnotrago is volatilised out of it. I thought at first, continued the captain, of avoiding the Zilnotrago by steering the ship around these spheres, but for this a long detour would be necessary which would greatly lengthen the time of our passage. On the other hand, to wait somewhere until the Silnotrago is dispersed will take still longer. In view of the sharp distinction in the alternatives before us, I cannot myself decide what to do, and so I have ventured to trouble you, your right reverence, for your competent advice. The captain, having finished speaking, Beelzebub fought a little and then said as follows, Really, I do not know how to advise you, my dear captain. Ah, yes, in that solar system where I existed for a long time, there is a planet called Earth. On that planet Earth arose, and still continue to arise, very strange free centred beings. And among the beings of a continent of that planet called Asia, there arose and existed a very wise free brain being, whom they called there Muller Nasir Adin. For each and every peculiar situation, great and small, in the existence of the beings there, Beelzebub continued, this same terrestrial sage, Muller Nasir Adin, had an apt and pithy saying. As all his sayings were full of the sense of truth for existence there, I also always used them there as a guide, in order to have a comfortable existence among the beings of that planet. And in the given case too, my dear captain, I intend to profit by one of his wise sayings. In such a situation as befallen us, he would probably say, you cannot jump over your knees, and it is absurd to try to kiss your own elbow. I now say the same to you, and I add, there is nothing to be done. When an event is impending, which arises from forces immeasurably greater than our own, one must submit. The only question is, which of the alternatives you mentioned should be chosen? That is, to wait somewhere or to add to our journey by a detour? You say that to make a detour will greatly lengthen our journey, but that waiting will take still longer. 
Good, my dear Captain. Suppose that by making the detour we should save a little time. What do you think? Is the wear and tear of the parts of our ship's machinery worthwhile for the sake of ending our journey a little sooner? If the detour should involve even the most trifling damage to our ship, then in my opinion we ought to prefer your second suggestion. That is, to stop somewhere until the path is cleared of the noxious Seal Nutrago. By that means we should spare our ship useless damage. And we will try to fill the period of this unforeseen delay with something useful for us all. For instance, it would give me personally great pleasure to talk with you about contemporary ships in general, and about our ship in particular. Very many new things, of which I still know nothing, have been done in this field during my absence from these parts. For example, in my time these big trans-space ships were so complicated and cumbersome that it took almost half their power to carry the materials necessary to elaborate their possibility of locomotion. But in their simplicity and the freedom on them, these contemporary ships are just embodiments of bliss du cano. There is such a simplicity for beings upon them and such freedom and respect of all being manifestations that at times you forget that you are not on one of the planets. So, my dear Captain, I should like very much to know how this boom was brought about and how the contemporary ships work. But now go and make all the arrangements necessary for the required stopping and then, when you are quite free, come to me again and we will pass the time of our unavoidable delay in conversation useful for us all. When the captain had gone, Hussein suddenly sprang to his feet and began to dance and clap his hands and shout, Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad of this. Beelzebub looked with affection on those joyous manifestations of his favourite, but old Ahun could not restrain himself and, shaking his head reproachfully, called the boy, half to himself, a growing egoist. Hearing what Ahun called him, Hussein stopped in front of him and, looking at him mischievously, said, Don't be angry with me, old Ahun. The reason for my joy is not egoism, but only the coincidence which chances to be happy for me. You heard, didn't you? My dear grandfather did not decide only just to make a stop, but he also promised the captain to talk with him. And you know, don't you, that the talks of my dear grandfather always brings out tales of places where he has been, and you know also how delightfully he tells them and how much new and interesting information becomes crystallised in our presences from these tales. Where is the egoism? Hasn't he himself, of his own free will, having weighed with his wise reason all the circumstances of this unforeseen event, decided to make a stop which, evidently, doesn't upset his intended plans very much? It seems to me that my dear grandfather has no need to hurry, Everything necessary for his rest and comfort is present on the Karnak, and here also are many who love him and whom he loves. Don't you remember? He said recently, we must not oppose forces higher than our own, and added that not only one must not oppose them, but even submit and receive all their results with reverence, at the same time praising and glorifying the wonderful and providential works of our Lord Creator. I am not glad because of the misadventure, but because an unforeseen event issuing from above has occurred, owing to which we shall be able to listen once more to the tales of my dear grandfather. Is it my fault that the circumstances are by chance most desirable and happy for me? No, dear Ahun, not only should you not rebuke me, but you should join me in expressing gratitude to the source of all beneficent results that arise. All this time, Beelzebub listened attentively and with a smile to the chatter of his favourite, and when he had finished said, You are right, dear Hussein, and for being right, I will tell you, even before the captain's arrival, anything you like. Upon hearing this, the boy at once ran and sat at the feet of Beelzebub, and after thinking a little said, my dear grandfather, you have told me so much about the solar system where you spent so many years that now perhaps I should continue just by logic alone to describe the details of the nature of that peculiar corner of our universe. But I am curious to know 
whether there dwell free brain beings on the planet of that solar system and whether higher being bodies are coated in them. Please tell me now about just this, dear Grandfather, concluded her saying, looking affectionately up at Beelzebub. Yes, replied Beelzebub, on almost all the planets of that solar system also, free brain beings dwell, and in almost all of them higher being bodies can be coated. Higher being bodies, or as they are called on some planets of that solar system, souls, arise in the free brain beings breeding on all the planets except those before reaching which the emanations of our most holy sun absolute are into repeated deflections, gradually lose the fullness of their strength and eventually cease entirely to contain the vivific power for coating higher being bodies. Certainly, my boy, on each separate planet of that solar system also, the planetary bodies of the free brain beings are coated and take an exterior form in conformity with the nature of the given planet and are adapted in their details to the surrounding nature. For instance, on that planet on which it was ordained that all we exiles should exist, namely the planet Mars, the free brain beings are coated with planetary bodies having the form, how shall I tell you, a form like a corona, that is to say, they have a long broad trunk amply provided with fat, and heads with enormous protruding and shining eyes. On the back of this enormous planetary body of theirs are two large wings, and on the underside two comparatively small feet with very strong claws. Almost the whole strength of this enormous planetary body is adapted by nature to generate energy for their eyes and for their wings. As a result, the free brain beings breeding on that planet can see freely everywhere, whatever the cow de tree, and they can also move not only over the planet itself, but also in its atmosphere, and some of them occasionally even manage to travel beyond the limits of its atmosphere. The free brain beings breeding on another planet, a little below the planet Mars, owing to the intense cold there, are covered with thick soft wool. The external form of these free centred beings is like that of a two sock, that is, it resembles a kind of double sphere, the upper sphere serving to contain the principal organs of the whole planetary body, and the other, the lower sphere, the organs for the transformation of the first and second being foods. There are three apertures in the upper sphere, opening outwards, two serve for sight and the third for hearing. The other, the lower sphere, has only two apertures, one in front for taking in the first and second being foods, and the other at the back for the elimination from the organism of residues. To the lower sphere are also attached two very strong sinewy feet, and on each of these is a growth that serves the purpose of fingers with us. There is still another planet, a quite small one, bearing the name Moon in that solar system, my dear boy. During its motion, this peculiar little planet often approached very near to our planet Mars, and sometimes, during whole Kilprinos, I took great pleasure in observing, through my Tescuanu, in my observatory, the process of existence of the free brain beings upon it. Though the beings of this planet have very frail planetary bodies, they have, on the other hand, a very strong spirit, owing to which they all possess an extraordinary perseverance and capacity for work. In exterior form, they resemble what are called large ants, and, like these, they are always bustling about, working both on and within their planet. The results of their ceaseless activity are now already plainly visible. I once happened to notice that during two of our years, they tunnelled, so to say, the whole of their planet. They were compelled to undertake this task on account of the abnormal local climatic conditions, which are due to the fact that this planet arose unexpectedly, and the regulation of its climatic harmony was therefore not prearranged by the higher powers. The climate of this planet is mad, and in its variability, 
it could give points to the most highly strung hysterical women existing on another of the planets of that same solar system, of which I shall also tell you. Sometimes there are such frosts on this moon that everything is frozen through and through, and it becomes impossible for beings to breathe in the open atmosphere. And then suddenly it becomes so hot there that an egg can be cooked in its atmosphere in a jiffy. For only two short periods on that peculiar little planet, namely before and after its complete revolution about its neighbour, another planet nearby, the weather is so glorious that for several rotations the whole planet is in blossom and yields the various products for their first being food, greatly in excess of their general need during their existence in that peculiar intraplanetary kingdom which they have arranged and where they are protected from all the vagaries of this mad climate, inharmoniously changing the state of the atmosphere. Nearest to that small planet is another, a larger planet, which also occasionally approaches quite close to the planet Mars, and is called Earth. The said moon is just a part of this Earth, and the latter must now constantly maintain the moon's existence. On the just-mentioned planet Earth, also free brain beings are formed, and they also contain all the data for coating higher being bodies in themselves. But in strength of spirit, they do not begin to compare with the beings breeding on the little planet aforementioned. The external coatings of the free brain beings of that planet Earth closely resemble our own, only, first of all, their skin is a little slimier than ours and then, secondly, they have no towel, and their heads are without horns. What is worse about them is their feet, namely they have no hoofs. It is true that for protection against external influences, they have invented what they call boots, but this invention does not help them very much. Apart from the imperfection of their exterior form, their reason also is quite uniquely strange. Their being reason owing to very many causes about which also I may tell you some time, has gradually degenerated, and at the present time is very, very strange and exceedingly peculiar. Beelzebub would have said still more, but the captain of the ship entering at that moment, Beelzebub, after promising the boy to tell him about the beings of the planet Earth on another occasion, began to talk with the captain. Beelzebub asked the captain to tell him, First, who he was, how long he had been captain, and how he liked his work, and afterwards to explain some of the details of the contemporary cosmic ships. Thereupon the captain said, You're right, reverence. I was destined by my father, as soon as I reached the age of a responsible being for this career in the service of our endless creator. Starting with the lowest positions on the trans-space ships, I ultimately merited to perform the duties of captain, and it is now eight years that I have been captain on the long-distance ships. This last post of mine, namely that of captain of the ship Karnak, I took, strictly speaking, in succession to my father, when, after his long years of blameless service to his endlessness, in the performance of the duties of captain from almost the very beginning of the world creation, he had become worthy to be promoted to the post of ruler of the Soli system, Cowman. In short, continued the captain, I began my service just when your right reverence was departing for the place of your exile. I was still only a sweeper on the long-distance ships of that period. Yes, a long, long time has passed by. Everything has undergone change, and is changed since then. Only our Lord and Sovereign remains unchanged the blessings of Amen Zanu, on his unchangeableness throughout eternity. You, your right reverence, have condescended to remark very justly that the former ships were very inconvenient and cumbersome. Yes, they were then, indeed very complicated and cumbersome. I too remember them very well. There is an enormous difference between the ships of that time and the ships now. In our youth, all such ships, both for intersystem and for interplanetary communication, were still run on the cosmic substance, Elikilpom Actistion, which is a totality consisting of two separate parts of the omnipresent 
Oki Darnock. And it was to obtain this totality that just those numerous materials were necessary which the former ships had to carry. But these ships did not remain in use long after you flew from these parts, having soon thereafter been replaced by ships of the system of St. Phenoma. Chapter 4 The Law of Falling The captain continued, This happened in the year 185 by objective time calculation. Saint Venoma had been taken for his merits from the planet Sult to the holy planet Purgatory, where, after he had familiarised himself with his new surroundings and new duties, he gave all his free time to his favourite work. And his favourite work was to seek what new phenomena could be found in various combinations of already existing law-conformable phenomena. And some time later, in the course of these occupations, this Saint Venoma first constated in cosmic laws what later became a famous discovery, and this discovery he first called the Law of Falling. This cosmic law which he then discovered, Saint Venoma himself formulated thus, Everything existing in the world falls to the bottom, and the bottom for any part of the universe is its nearest stability, and this said stability is the place or the point upon which all the lines of force arriving from all directions converge. The centres of all the suns and of all the planets of our universe are just such points of stability. They are the lowest points of those regions of space upon which forces from all directions of the given part of the universe definitely tend and where they are concentrated. In these points there is also concentrated the equilibrium which enables suns and planets to maintain their position. In this formation of his, Saint Venoma said further that everything, when dropped into space, wherever it may be, tends to fall on one or another sun or on one or another planet, according to which sun or planet the given part of space belongs to, where the object is dropped, each sun or planet being for the given sphere the stability or bottom. Starting from this, St. Venoma reasoned in his further researches as follows. If this be so, may it not therefore be possible to employ this cosmic particularity for the locomotion we need between the spaces of the universe? And from then on he worked in this direction. His fervour, saintly labours showed that although in principle this was in general possible, yet it was impossible fully to employ for this purpose this law of falling discovered by him, and it would be impossible owing solely to the atmospheres around most of the cosmic concentrations, which atmospheres would hinder the straight falling of the object dropped in space. Having constated this, Saint Venoma then devoted his whole attention to discovering some means of overcoming the said atmospheric resistance of ships constructed on the principle of falling. And after three lunaises, Saint Venoma did find such a possibility, and later on, when the building of a suitable special construction had been completed under his direction, he proceeded to practical trials. This special construction had the appearance of a large enclosure, all the walls of which were made of a special material, something like glass. Then to every side of that large enclosure were fitted things like shutters of a material impervious to the rays of the cosmic substance Elikilpomactician, and these shutters, although closely fitted to the walls of the said enclosure, could yet freely slide in every direction. Within the enclosure was placed a special battery, generating and giving this same substance elikilpromagnetism. I myself, your right reverence, was present at the first trials made by Saint Venoma according to the principles he had discovered. The whole secret lay in this, that when the rays of elikilpromagnetism were made to pass through this special glass, then in all the space they reached, everything usually composing the atmosphere itself or planets, such as air, every kind of gas, fog and so on, was destroyed. 
This part of space became indeed absolutely empty and had neither resistance nor pressure, so that if even an infant being pushed this enormous structure, it would move forward as easily as a feather. To the outer side of this peculiar structure, there were attached appliances similar to wings, which were set in motion by means of this same substance, El Kilpo Magtisen, and served to give the impetus to move all this enormous construction in the required direction. The results of these experiments, having been approved and blessed by the Commission of Inspection under the presidency of Archangel Adosia, the construction of a big ship based on these principles was begun. The ship was soon ready and commissioned for service, and in a short time, little by little, ships of this type came to be used exclusively on all the lines of inter-system communication. Although later, you're right, reverence, the inconveniences of this system gradually became more and more apparent, nevertheless it continued to displace all the systems that had existed before. It cannot be gainsaid that although the ships constructed on this system were ideal in atmosphereless spaces, a move that almost with the speed of the rays et zilkolninian carnian issuing from planets, yet when nearing some sun or planet it became real torture for the beings directing them as a great deal of complicated manoeuvring was necessary. The need for this manoeuvring was due to the same law of falling, and this was because when the ship came into the medium of the atmosphere of some sun or planet which it had to pass, it immediately began to fall towards that sun or planet, and as I have already intimated, very much care and considerable knowledge were needed to prevent the ship from falling out of its course. While the ships were passing near any sun or planet whatsoever, their speed of locomotion had sometimes to be reduced hundreds of times below their usual rate. It was particularly difficult to steer them in those spheres where there was a great aggregation of comets. That is why great demands were then made upon the beings who had to direct these ships, and they were prepared for those duties by beings of very high reason. But in spite of the said drawbacks of the system of St. Venoma, it gradually, as I have already said, displaced all the previous systems. And the ships of this system of St. Venoma had already existed for 23 years when it was first rumoured that the angel Hariton had invented a new type of ship for inter-system and interplanetary communication. Chapter 5 The System of Archangel Hariton And indeed, soon after this rumour, Practical experiments open to all, again under the superintendence of the great archangel Adosia, were made with this new and later very famous invention. This new system was unanimously acknowledged to be the best, and very soon it was adopted for general universal service, and thereafter gradually all previous systems were entirely superseded. That system of the great angel, now Archangel, Hariton, is now in use everywhere at the present day. The ship on which we are now flying also belongs to this system, and its construction is similar to that of all the ships built on the system of the angel Hariton. This system is not very complicated. The whole of this great invention consists of only a single cylinder shaped like an ordinary barrel. The secret of this cylinder lies in the disposition of the materials of which its inner side is made. These materials are arranged in a certain order and isolated from each other by means of amber. They have such a property that if any cosmic gaseous substance whatever enters the space which they enclose, whether it be atmosphere, air, ether, or any other totality of homogeneous cosmic elements, it immediately expands owing to the mentioned disposition of materials within the cylinder. The bottom of this cylinder barrel is hermetically sealed, but its lid, although it can be closely shut, yet is so arranged on hinges that at a pressure from within it can be opened and shut again. So, your right reverence, 
If this cylinder barrel is filled with atmosphere, air or any other such substance, then from the action of the walls of this peculiar cylinder barrel, these substances expand to such an extent that the interior becomes too small to hold them. Striving to find an outlet from this, for them constricted interior, they naturally press also against the lid of the cylinder barrel, and thanks to the said hinges, the lid opens, and, having allowed these expanded substances to escape, immediately closes again. And as in general nature abhors a vacuum, then simultaneously, with the release of the expanded gaseous substances, the cylinder barrel is again filled with fresh substances from outside, with which in their turn the same proceeds as before, and so on without end. Thus the substances are always being changed, and the lid of the cylinder barrel alternately opens and shuts. To this same lid there is fixed a very simple lever which moves with the movement of the lid and in turn sets in motion certain also very simple cog wheels which again in their turn revolve the fans attached to the sides and stern of the ship itself. Thus, your right reverence, in spaces where there is no resistance, contemporary ships like ours simply fall towards the nearest stability but in spaces where there are any cosmic substances which offer resistance, these substances, whatever their density, with the aid of this cylinder enable the ship to move in any desired direction. It is interesting to remark that the denser the substance is in any given part of the universe, the better and more strongly the charging and discharging of this cylinder barrel proceed, and in consequence of course, the force of the movement of the levers is also changed. But nevertheless, I repeat, a sphere without atmosphere, that is, a space containing only world ephrocrino, is for contemporary ships also the best, because in such a sphere there is no resistance at all, and the law of falling can therefore be fully employed in it without any assistance from the work of the cylinder. Further than this, the contemporary ships are also good because they contain such possibilities that in atmosphereless spaces an impetus can be given to them in any direction and they can fall just where desired without the complicated manipulations necessary in ships of the system of St. Venuma. In short, your right reverence, the convenience and simplicity of the contemporary ships are beyond comparison with former ships, which were often both very complicated and at the same time had none of the possibilities of the ships we use now. Chapter 6. Perpetual Motion Wait, wait, Beelzebub interrupted the captain. This, what you have just told us, must surely be just that short-lived idea which the strange free brain beings breeding on the planet Earth called perpetual motion, and on account of which at one period a great many of them there went quite, as they themselves say, mad, and may even perished entirely. It once happened there on that ill-fated planet that somebody in some way or another got into his head the, as they say, crazy notion that he could make a mechanism that would run forever without requiring any material from outside. This notion so took everybody's fancy that most of the queer fellows of that peculiar planet began thinking about it and trying to realise this miracle in practice. How many of them paid for this short-lived idea with all the material and spiritual welfare which they had previously with great difficulty acquired? For one reason or another, they were all quite determined to invent what in their opinion was a simple matter. External circumstances permitting, many took up the invention of this perpetual motion without any inner data for such work, some from reliance upon their knowledge, others upon luck, but most of them just from their already complete psychopathy. In short, the invention of perpetual motion was, as they say, the rage, 
and every crank felt obliged to be interested in this question. I was once in one of the towns there, where models of every kind and innumerable descriptions of proposed mechanisms for this perpetual motion were assembled. What wasn't there? What ingenious and complicated machines did I not see? In any single one of these mechanisms I saw there, there must have been more ideas and wise acrings than in all the laws of world creation and world existence. I noted at the time that in these innumerable models and descriptions of proposed mechanisms, the idea of using what is called the force of weight predominated, and the idea of employing the force of weight they explained thus, a very complicated mechanism was to lift some weight, and this latter was then to fall, and by its fall set the whole mechanism in motion, which motion would again lift the weight, and so on and so on. The result of it all was that thousands were shut up in lunatic asylums. Thousands more, having made this idea their dream, either began to fail altogether to fulfil even those being duties of theirs which had somehow or other in the course of many years been established there, or to fulfil them in such a way as couldn't be worse. I don't know how it would all have ended if some quite demented being there, with one foot already in the grave, such a one as they themselves call an old dotard, and who had previously somehow acquired a certain authority, had not proved by calculations known only to himself that it was absolutely impossible to invent perpetual motion. Now, after your explanation, I can well understand how the cylinder of the system of Archangel Hariton works. It is the very thing of which these unfortunates there dreamed. Indeed, of the cylinder of the system of the Archangel Hariton, it can safely be said that, with atmosphere alone given, it will work perpetually without need in the expenditure of any outside materials. And since the world without planets and hence without atmospheres cannot exist, then it follows that as long as the world exists and, in consequence, atmospheres, the cylinder barrels invented by the great archangel Hariton will always work. Now just one question occurs to me about the material from which this cylinder barrel is made. I wish very much, my dear Captain, that you would roughly tell me what materials it is made of and how long they can last, requested Beelzebub. To this question of Beelzebub's, the captain replied as follows. Although the cylinder barrel does not last forever, it can certainly last a very long time. Its chief part is made of amber with platinum hoops, and the interior panels of the walls are made of anthracite, copper and ivory, and a very strong mastic, unaffectable either by one, paschika, or by two, tainolair or by free, salia coriapa, or even by the radiations of cosmic concentrations. But the other parts, the captain continued, both the exterior levers and the cogwheels, must certainly be renewed from time to time, for though they are made of the strongest metal, yet long use will wear them out. And as for the body of the ship itself, its long existence can certainly not be guaranteed. The captain intended to say still more, but at that moment a sound like the vibrations of a long minor chord of a far-off orchestra of wind instruments resounded through the ship. With an apology, the captain rose to leave, explaining as he did so that he must be needed on very important business, since everybody knew that he was with his right reverence and would not venture to trouble the ears of his right reverence for anything trifling. Chapter 7. Being Aware of Genuine Being Duty After the captain had gone, Beelzebub glanced at his grandson and, noticing his unusual state, asked him solicitously and with some anxiety, What is the matter, my dear boy? What are you thinking so deeply about? Looking up at his grandfather with eyes full of sorrow, Hussein said thoughtfully, I don't know what is the matter with me my dear grandfather, but your talk with the captain of the ship has brought me to some exceedingly melancholy thoughts. Things of which I have never before thought are now a-thinking in me. 
Thanks to your talk, it has gradually become very clear to my consciousness that in the universe of our endlessness, everything has not always been such as I now see and understand. Formerly, for instance, I should never have allowed such faults associatively to proceed in me as that this ship on which we are now flying has not always been as it is at this moment. Only now have I come very clearly to understand that everything we have at the present time and everything we use, in a word, all the contemporary amenities and everything necessary for our comfort and welfare, have not always existed and did not make their appearance so easily. It seems that certain beings in the past have, during very long periods, laboured and suffered very much for this, and endured a great deal which perhaps they even need not have endured. They laboured and suffered only in order that we might now have all this, and use it for our welfare. And all this they did, either consciously or unconsciously, just for us, that is to say, for beings quite unknown and entirely indifferent to them. And now not only do we not thank them, but we do not even know a thing about them, but take it all as in the natural order, and neither ponder nor trouble ourselves about this question at all. I, for instance, have already existed so many years in the universe, yet the thought has never even entered my head that perhaps there was a time when everything I see and have did not exist, and that everything was not born with me like my nose. And so, my dear and kind grandfather, now that owing to your conversation with the captain, I have gradually, with all my presence, become aware of all of this. There has arisen in me, side by side with this, the need to make clear to my reason why I personally have all the comforts which I now use, and what obligations I am under for them. It is just because of this that at the present moment there proceeds in me a process of remorse. Having said this, Hussein drooped his head and became silent, and Beelzebub, looking at him affectionately, began to speak as follows. I advise you, my dear Hussein, not to put such questions to yourself yet. Do not be impatient. Only when that period of your existence arrives which is proper for your becoming aware of such essence questions and you actively mentate about them will you understand what you must do in return. Your present age does not yet oblige you to pay for your existence. The time of your present age is not given you in which to pay for your existence but for preparing yourself for the future for the obligations becoming to a responsible free brain being. So in the meantime, exist as you exist, only do not forget one thing. Namely, at your age, it is indispensably necessary that every day at sunrise, while watching the reflection of its splendour, you bring about a contact between your consciousness and the various unconscious parts of your general presence. Try to make this state last and to convince the unconscious parts, as if they were conscious, that if they hinder your general functioning, they, in the period of your responsible age, not only cannot fulfil the good that befits them, but your general presence of which they are part will not be able to be a good servant of our common endless creator, and by that will not even be worthy to pay for your arising and existence. I repeat once more, my dear boy, try in the meantime not to think about these questions, which at your age it is still early for you to think about. Everything in its proper time. Now ask me to tell you whatever you wish, and I will do so. As the captain has not yet returned, he must be occupied there with his duties, and will not be coming back so soon.